Good morning, everyone. My name is Gideon, and I'm in my second year in the Cyber Defense and Cloud Administration over here at MITT. So for today, we will be covering remote desktop protocol and remote access concepts. I know a lot of people will want that remote desktop uh, like a protocol. Just to give you a real life example of what it is and what it is doing. I believe a lot of us, we all got uh, command start, right? Uh, every one of you, have you, I understand some teachers are here. And for you who are the student, I believe you have TVs at home, right? And you also have the remote, right? You sit down at a particular spot in the house and you can control that TV. That's just the concept. So that you are right here in Winnipeg, there's a computer right there in Calgary, and you want a remote inside. So the word remote is saying that you are not right there. You are away and you're trying to connect to something which is not in your location. What we need to understand for this is remote desktop protocol is a proprietary protocol. It is strictly uh, attached to Windows. So Microsoft owns this protocol. Uh, maybe a lot of you are familiar with TeamViewers, AnyDesk. The protocols being used are not proprietary. They are like open source. But for this, it is strictly proprietary. And that's what we can see right here. So, and it's also a graphical user interface. It's used to connect another computer over a network. Each time you want to connect to someone or you want to connect to a device, you are always the client. So at home, your remote is the client, while the TV is the server. Remote desktop protocol consists of two parts. As I was saying, we have the remote desktop server, we have the remote desktop connection, or remote client connection. I tried to split it up so that when you try to use it on different system, like it wouldn't come up as remote desktop connection when you install it on other operating system. So connections cannot be established if the remote desktop server is not enabled. Just like you cannot use a Samsung remote to control an LG TV. The TV must be able to accept that connection. So there must be a server, and you don't need to worry about the server portion because it's all set up by the guys like Collins. So this is how the remote desktop connection looks like. When you go on your computer, you can just uh, press the start button and type in the word remote desktop connection. If you really look at this, you wonder there is no IP address. If you want to connect to a remote server or remote device, you need the IP address. Another thing you can use is the fully qualified domain name. And that is what you can see in this example. If you are not given an IP address, you also know how you can still connect so that you don't keep looking for an IP address when you are given the fully qualified domain name. So now we need to talk about some concepts. Now we mentioned remote desktop protocol. And we are all aware that this is a proprietary protocol, right? But right now, we want to talk about protocols which are not proprietary. That means it's not attached to a particular company. Anyone can use this protocol on any device. So the remote access refers to the ability to access a computer, such as a home computer or an office network computer. These are not all the protocols which are remote access protocols. These are just what you need for the event. So Telnet, it is one of the important protocols used for remote access. Connection is not secured because information is sent in plain text.
So what I'm going to be talking about is Cisco routers, obviously, uh, PuTTY, and how to use it. So Cisco router, uh, I'm going to read off the definition here. I think you guys have a pretty rough understanding of what it does here, but let's go over it. A router is a networking device that forwards data packets between computer networks. Uh, and I'll, I'll even stop right there just to break it down. A network could be like your house to your house, okay? So in order for information to get from one house to the other, it's got to go through your your router at home, which is also your modem, but we won't get too much into that. But that device is, is able to communicate from house to house or building to building or business to business, okay? Routers perform the traffic directing functions on the internet. Data sent through the internet, such as a web page or email, is in the form of data packets. A packet is typically forwarded from one router to another through networks that constitute an internetwork, the internet, until it reaches its destination node. Node is a client. So if you ever hear the term node, it's just a it's a client or a computer, okay? How do we access it? So we know that Cisco routers, uh, as well as other brands, not just Cisco, are typically accessed for configurations with a terminal emulator, so PuTTY, TerraTerm. Uh, a common way to configure routers are via command line, so SSH, Telnet, we learned about that. And obviously a console cable, so you guys know you could walk up to a router, plug in a cable, which I think some of the P-Tech guys have already done, right? So that's one of the obvious uh, ways to connect as well. And this is what it looks like. You guys are going to see a router at your competition. It's going to be somewhere, uh, but this is what you're connecting to. It looks like something like this. Okay. So this is PuTTY. So actually quite, quite easy to use. So I, I won't go over the, the definition because I think you guys kind of get it. It's really, it's a, it's a connection tool, right, to connect to these devices. So Gideon was pointing out earlier, you need this IP address to connect to the device, right? That's gonna be given to you guys at the competition, right? So this is gonna allow you to connect to the device. And then these are, this is your selection for port. So in this option, we have SSH connected, but the other option here is Telnet. So this is what it would look like here. You guys can actually enter this in and save your configurations if you want during the competition. So you can click save here and give it a name. So you can put router connection here. Click save, that way you guys don't have to constantly type in the IP address and the port. So that's a nice little quick little tip. So get to know PuTTY and TerraTerm. Both are, are fine, but uh, it's gonna help you guys out a lot. Why I wanted to show this is there's no graphical interface here. You guys are gonna have to be using your keyboard. You're gonna be pressing enter and space and typing, right? So you guys are gonna have to get really familiar with it. If this, uh, if this is a little bit intimidating, it's okay. Uh, there are some links at the end here where I have uh, some sites you can take a look at. There's tons of YouTube videos on the basic ways to harden your router, okay? So, but get familiar with this screen. Understand that you're, there's no next button. You're gonna have to be typing in things with your, uh, with your keyboard. Commands to know for the CDC. Don't wanna give it away too much, but hard, you're gonna to wanna to harden your router. So I've added some links where you can go and look about how to harden a router, okay? And hardening is just a term used for securing, okay? And, and disabling Telnet, which you guys are gonna find out why in the next slide is really important. Uh, some other ones are overriding or disabling uh, non-clear text passwords. So I should probably explain that a little bit. Disabling clear text passwords. There's gonna be a command in Cisco that uh, any clear text passwords that are set in place, you can encrypt them as well as you're gonna to wanna to make sure you're looking at really simple passwords. So if someone has a password, password 01, maybe change that password, just a hint. So you guys are gonna to wanna to know how to change that password. It's not a good password, right? Very easy to crack. Uh, CDP and LLDP, a little bit more confusing, but really to work with that protocol in this situation, it's quite easy. You're just gonna to wanna to disable it. So what CDP does is it stands for Cisco Discovery Protocol and allows you to connect or pardon me, it allows you to look at neighboring Cisco devices in your network. So if you work for a huge company or you work for the government and there's hundreds of routers and switches, a way to map out your network is with CDP. And LLDP is the uh, open, open standard protocol version, okay? So take a look at those. Again, you guys are gonna have access to these slides and information so you can take a look at these things after and, and look how to disable them. The disabling is actually quite easy. Okay, 
So what's going on here? If you guys, this is GNS3, by the way, so it's very similar to Packet Tracer, but you can actually do things like connect to the internet. That's what really separates them apart. This is what a terminal is going to look like. Okay, when you open this up, this is a, a Windows computer. So imagine just your Windows computer. And what I'm doing in this demo is, maybe I'll pause it here for a sec if I can, is this guy here on the far left, that's your Windows PC. Forget about the switch, not that important, okay? But this is a router, so this is what you're gonna be, you know, can imagine you're, you're connecting to uh, in a business, let's say, okay? And why you'd use a remote, uh, remote protocol is maybe you're, you're in a business and you're on the first floor and your router is on the 10th floor. You don't wanna go all the way upstairs and take that console cable and plug it in there, right? That's silly. So you'd use something like PuTTY and you'd use a protocol like Telnet or SSH or something like that. But if you use Telnet, you're gonna see why it's very, very bad and how easy it is for someone to snoop on your network and get some passwords. So this, this user is using a Windows PC. He's connecting to his router with Telnet. Again, just imagine it's on the 10th floor. I'm using something here called Wireshark. Wireshark allows you to snoop network traffic or I shouldn't just say it's for snooping, it's meant for troubleshooting as well. So this is, what I'm doing up here is you can apply a filter to Wireshark and I'm just gonna apply Telnet. So that's what I'm looking for. That's why I want to take a look through the, uh, the network traffic. Here we go, guys. So here is, uh, here's PuTTY for you guys are, are, are confused about how it's being used. I'm typing the address of the router. I want to connect to the router right now. And I'm going to switch over to Telnet. OK, so here we go, guys. Filtering for Telnet traffic. This is the traffic that is obviously specific to that protocol. I'm connecting from the Windows 10 PC to the router. I'm going to do some really simple. Watch the screen on the left there. I've entered, I've pressed enter twice. I've pressed enable, which brings you to the next screen. I've typed in a password here. You guys will find out soon it was the wrong password, as you can see, it's prompting again. I got in, great. So now what? It's, it's this easy, guys. I mean, if you're, if you're connecting and you know what you're doing. So, so it brings it back. Yeah, this is super temperamental. So I'm going to let it run again, but I'm going to talk through it. So what we saw at the end there, and it really doesn't hang there that long, is I can see everything. I can see the extra spaces put in. I can see the wrong password put in. I can see the right password put in. This is what a clear text protocol looks like. Who thinks that's kind of scary? That is kind of scary. Scary? Yeah, a little scary? Okay, good. Uh, it's basically, I'm monitoring all the Telnet traffic that's going over that wire. So I start, I start Wireshark, I run the program, and now it's, it's looking at all the traffic going over that wire from the Windows 10 PC to the router. It's not just looking for Telnet. It's, it's looking for, it's watching everything, but you can just use a filter bar at top to narrow it down to what you want to look at, okay, specifically, because there's so much going on. So now we're going to go back there. We can follow the stream. But yeah, it would be encrypted if you saw SSH. But you can decrypt stuff like HTTPS. There are methods, uh, there are methods to do that. Again, it's expensive. But So there you go, guys. So password was the wrong password. The other password was new password. OK, and got me in the router. Shows my spaces, shows everything in there. So this is why you disable it. This is why you don't use it. OK, so these are some links that I got here. I have Genus3 in there. I have Putty. You guys should have that download before you go to the competition, obviously, right? Don't waste any time. Uh, and then talking about Cisco, uh, this, the Cisco link is uh, it's a little, little lengthy, but the one below that talks about just basic router hardening. OK, so let's touch on remote access concepts. First of all, what do you, what do you want to remote into? Is it, it all depends, of course. Is it personal? Is it work? Is it an application or a remote computer or a remote network? But what do you want to remote access into or what do you need? Do you need an application? Do you need folders? Do you need files? Is it an actual remote computer where you're going to be remotely accessing as well? But the general rule of thumb, the more specific the request, the more granular, like folders and files, the more security and the more steps you have to take to get that access. Now, touching on remote access concepts as well for the open SSH, which is a feature on Windows 10. All your Windows 10 machines have it. You can use it. 
but it's a very granular level. SSH works best in the, in the concept of folders and files access in there. The difference with VPN, VPN you can access an actual entire network if you need to. This is where the VPN comes in, virtual private network. VPN is a Windows feature, and actually I, I'm not sure if it's another feature, well, but I know for sure for Windows, it's actually a secure tunnel from, from a network or a computer that you can access the information or access the network that you need. And it works in the concepts of an IP address and of course a username and password. So you have to be registered on a network in a domain environment to actually get into there. So it's not just a matter of just having it and then access it and, 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 and then going through the process. There is a process on the other side where you have to be allocated the actual access and security. RDP, here we go again, remote desktop protocol. Once again, a built-in feature is Windows 10, Windows 8.1, Windows 7. It's been there for a while now. It's been there for at least 20 years, to my knowledge, RDP. Uh, it's a very good protocol, but also, as well, it can be used for abuse. And that's where you have to be very careful, of course. Now, going past that, Windows systems have been best practices. It could be either a standalone, like your ordinary laptops, or you could be actually on a domain where you have the administrator rights to do it. Yeah. You can yeah. go on any computer if you, have the, if you have the actual security rights. That as well, you have to be interested in that. And once again, it can be used for good and it can be used for bad. So there's three basics. Windows updates, antivirus, and the Windows firewall, at least for your local computers. This can also attain to a domain environment. And, and uh, we'll see, we'll go from there. Now, Windows systems, uh, sorry, Windows updates, are they really necessary? In short, yes. And there's a reason why. 15 years ago, you'd be hard pressed to find HTTPS on a website. Everything was HTTP. So, very little security, and so it, 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 I, I guess in relative terms now. So therefore, the, the, there was an interesting study, uh, it was a number of years ago that somebody put a computer on the internet without any updates, without any firewall, without any kind of security. I don't think it even lasted half an hour before it got hit by some malware or spyware. Not even 30 minutes. That's how dirty it is essentially in, in, in a sense. So that's why you need Windows updates on your, all, all, and, and all like Macs, you know, Windows, it doesn't matter. You need updates eventually. Only in some certain cases, you would not get updates. In my, for example, it, where I work, there are a few computers that have very proprietary software that only work with that computer or that application, whatever it is. The manufacturer of that software only says, my software will only work up to this update, and that's it. You update it, you're on your own. But that, that is the only case that I know of where you would not update a computer or a server or any, or any other kind of end, uh, PC or computer, it doesn't really matter. You have to do the updates. There's the critical ones you always need, and there's also the optional ones. The optional ones, give or take, it's, it's up to you. But the critical ones, always get them. Antivirus, there's free and there's paid, and you get what you pay for. There's advantages and disadvantages. Like any antivirus, it's like, I, I use the analogy of an apple tree. If you go to an apple tree, there's always apples you're gonna be able to pick, right? but there's always ones that you can't pick because they're too high or for whatever reason. And that's the same analogy with any antivirus, whether you pay for it or not. The only difference with the paid one, it's got more features. It's got more, you can use it as a firewall to block certain traffic or ports and so forth. With a free one, no, it's just a very basic, for like if, but if you work in a network environment like I do, you have to pay for the antivirus because it has to work on many computers and has to be managed from an enterprise server. That's the main difference, and you gotta pay for that. It's all based on licensing. How many, how many laptops do you have in your environment? Now, the, the other thing as well, with Windows 7 now being discontinued, a lot of these new antiviruses, are, or antivirus suites, are not supporting Windows 7 anymore. For your case, you'd wanna enable it. That's what you'd want. But also, inherently, if you work in a domain, like in an actual like network domain, whether if you're a system administrator, you usually want that off. And the reason is, is because you won't be able to access any of the network resources if that is on. It'll block everything. But if you're trying, in some cases, if you're trying to SSH or Telnet, that could potentially, if that's on, that'll block it. Oh yeah, sure, yes, yes, I was just about to add to that. Yeah, you can make rules where you can make exceptions, yeah. but that, that's a very granular level as well. So you have to really be very careful what you block and what you don't block. Because as the internet evolves, so do threats. You have to be on top of it. And you have to, like, you, you have to update, the, like, up, like updates, but also firmware updates on your, on your, on your, on your wireless routers.
My name is Steven. I'm going to be showing you basic Linux. What is Linux? Linux is a free open source operating system. It's used all over the world for personal use and servers. There are many different distributions of Linux, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. It can be overwhelming for first time users. The terminal CLI is the shell of a, is a command line interface that interprets user commands and tells the operating system what to do. When you first open the terminal, you'll be greeted with a screen that has the following line, MITT at CDCA colon tilde dollar sign. In our case, MITT is our account username, CDCA is our host name or domain name, tilde is our current working directory or our home directory, and the dollar sign is the prompt for the user to input a command. This is an image of the terminal if you've never seen it, an image of what I just explained, as you can see. Linux command line. Commands can be issued at the command prompt by specifying the name of an ex executable file or script. There are many standard Linux commands and utilities that come uh, with the OS itself that allow you to navigate the file system, install packages, and configure systems and applications. An instance of a running command is known as a process. Linux is globally case sensitive. You can press the tab key to auto-complete unique commands or paths. Uh, commands without arguments. There are many commands that can be ran without anything additional other than the command itself. Such as, sh yeah, such an example is ls, short for list. ls prints all files inside uh, your current working directory. You can of course attach arguments or options to these commands. For instance, ls la, which prints all files on a list, including hidden files in the current directory in a more readable format. So uh, that's what ls looks like. It just kind of prints all the files and directories inside the current working directory, which is your home at the moment, in kind of like this like two by whatever. And then if you were to add l, which is, makes it a list, it now makes it more readable. And what was all that? The second command outputted something more than just the folders and files of the directory. LSL shows uh, file or directory, size, modify date and time, file or folder name, and owner of the file and its permissions. LSLH makes it more human readable, as you're about to see. We can also run a command called clear. Clear cleans the terminal screen of all text. So that, this is after running clear. So L, uh, H makes it so, you see this is 4K. In the previous example, it was 496, so 496 bytes. Now it's just four kilobytes. So it's just, it's easier to read when it's a larger number. Uh, commands with arguments. <coughs> Continuing off the last example, some commands require us to provide additional options to go places or do things. CD, change directory on its own, changes your current working directory to your home directory, AKA the tilde. However, if we were to string a path to CD, we would then go to the path we specified, CD user source. And then our prompt would change from MITT at CDCA colon tilde to MITT at CDCA colon forward slash user forward slash source. Uh, you also didn't need to CD to the directory that you want to list its contents of. You can just type ls followed by the path and then this is an example, so pwd print working directory, so uh, forward slash home slash MITT, and then I see cd to the user source, print, yeah, permissions. Every file and directory on a Linux system is assigned three types of owner. When we ran lsl, actually I'll just show it. Actually this works. So this right here are your permissions, and now, a user is the owner of the file. A, the user who, created, who creates the file is the owner. A group can cont contain multiple users. All users belonging to a group have the same permissions. Other is any other user who has access to this file. The user neither created nor belongs to a group. Practically, it means everybody else. Do I have permission for this? Every file and directory has three permissions defined by the three owners. Read aka read only. This is your permission to read said file. The read permission on a directory gives you the ability to list its contents. Write gives you the authority to modify the contents of a file. 
the write permission on a directory gives you the authority to add, remove, and rename files stored in the directory. Execute. In Windows, an executable program usually has an extension, .exe, in which you can easily run. In Linux, you cannot run a program unless the execute permission is set. If the execute permission is not set, you might still be able to see slash modify the program code, provided read and write permissions are set, but not run it. So here's a little uh, example I made here. So let's take D, R, W, X. D is a directory. R is read permission. W is write permission. X is execute permission. And hyphen or dash is no permission. So users have readable, writable, and executable permissions on this directory. And then the group permissions. I don't have to go over that again. Groups have readable and execute permissions, but not writable permissions because there is no W set. And then on the other one, the exact same, readable and write, uh, executable, but no writing privileges. The left hand most uh, four quadrants or four values are, are your user permissions. And then the three after the X, it's now group permissions. So there's only three and then three for other. So it's four, three, three. But directory is obviously not really important. So it's more just three, three, three. So ch uh, change mod is used to change permissions. There are two ways to use this command. Absolute mode and symbolic mode, which I'm not going to cover. Chmod can be run like the following. Chmod permissions file name. And there's an example, chmod 700 file1.txt. So absolute mode. Zero is equal. So we, we, we have 700 there. So zero is no permissions. Seven is all permissions. So it would be uh, user has all permissions, but then group and other have zero permissions because it's seven zero zero. So example, with all that information, chmod 700 file.txt would make the file not readable, writable, or executable by groups or other except the user who has full control. You can see that they just have, only the user has RWX because it's set to seven. So the grep search filter uh, for a particular pattern of characters and displays all lines that contain that pattern. Syntax, grep, option, pattern, files. So uh, hyphen C is this prints only a count of the lines that match a pattern. Hyphen H displays the matched lines but do, does not display the file names. I ignores case for matching. L displays the list of file names only and displays the matched lines and their line numbers. V, this prints out all lines that do not match the pattern, and W is match the whole word. Hey everyone, nice to meet you. My name is Zach. I'm actually here with the software developer program in MITT, so when these guys talk about security stuff, I have no idea what they're talking about most of the time. Um, so in software development, we actually build the stuff that these guys then write things and program things to protect. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about basic web app architecture. So it's, it's an application that typically exists on the web, but we can also put on our desktop off a lot of the time. Um, the most common context I think of it is in websites, uh, which everyone's obviously familiar with. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about client side, which is what we're used to looking at when we're visiting websites on our computer. Uh, in web development, we often refer to that as front end. And also server side, so what's going on behind the scenes from where we're actually requesting this stuff. Uh, so we're going to cover how clients request web apps from servers, what they're built out of, how to recognize some basic HTML and JavaScript, which are two of the languages that most web apps are built out of, uh, how different files in web app communicate, because there's often a lot of files that are growing into these, uh, what databases might look like and what goes on inside of them when we ask for data, and how to research what you're looking at. Uh, research is a huge part of web app development. I have a very short memory span. So I forget the languages that I'm using pretty regularly, so research is a big part of my job. 
Uh, we're not covering how to build a website, how to break other people's <coughs> websites, or how to spot malicious code and markup. That's at least the spotting malicious code stuff is on you guys. Um, I'm not going to encourage anybody to break anything. Um, but basically, when I am getting a web app, so when I'm getting a website, I, the client, am making a request from the server for stuff. And the server is hopefully going to respond with stuff. This cadence of request and response is really the rhythm that drives a lot of web apps, or pretty much all of them. This takes place over something called HTTP, or Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And what this basically is is an agreement that my browser, uh, like Google Chrome is the one I use most often, it's an agreement that my browser has with the server. I am agreeing to use Hypertext Transfer Protocol to get the content. Uh, more recently, we see a lot more of HTTPS, which is Secure Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which is generally better. Um, these guys know a lot more about why that's the case than I do, but generally, if you see HTTP without the S, bad. And typically, we're getting HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files. Uh, now, this, I think there's kind of this magical idea about what is happening over the web when we're getting stuff. But basically, when I'm making a request for a web page, I'm asking for a copy of a folder of this stuff. And my browser is going to interpret HTML, CSS, and JavaScript as the web page. So when I ask Facebook, can I have a Facebook page? Facebook is sending me a folder of this stuff. So what does that look like? Uh, well, like I said, we've got our three sides on client. This is what our machine gets. That's markup, which is what the app says. That's typically in HTML. Mm -hmm. Styling, which is how it looks. That's in CSS. We don't need CSS, but you really do. Uh, things look terrible without it. And scripting, which is what the app does. That's typically in JavaScript. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about HTML. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. It's technically not a programming language. It's a language that we feed into the browser, and the browser decides what that looks like for us. So here I've got a bunch of tags containing content, which go through my Google Chrome, and I get content back that looks like something a normal human would look at. Uh, basic anatomy of this, we have our P, which stands for paragraph. And inside of it, we have our content. The P tag tells our browser this wants to be a paragraph, and we have the content inside. So if you want a really base, actually, uh, before we get into that, so this is uh, w3schools.com. Excellent, excellent website, especially if you're a beginner. This has a reference to every single HTML tag that exists. There's a lot of them. You'll probably use about 10 regularly, or maybe 20. But as you can see, it's impossible to remember all of this stuff. So if you see a tag in a website and you don't remember what it says or you don't remember what it does, Google it. And I can see exactly what it means. So if I click on P here, it shows me exactly how paragraph tag is used. Uh, now, if you want to know what pure HTML looks like, uh, this is one of my favorite websites on the internet. It was built by a guy called uh, Patrick Michaud in 1994. Um, this is pure HTML. This is what HTML without any CSS or JavaScript looks like. Uh, Dr. Michaud in 94 wanted to see if HTML was a good way for conveying information to other people over the internet. So he made a website about what happens if you put strawberry Pop-Tarts in the toaster for too long. <laughs> As it turns out, they explode. Uh, hopefully that's been fixed over 25 years. But um, Now this is just HTML. Again, this is what my browser is interpreting the HTML to look like. And I can use several different tools to see what this is like under the hood. Um, my two favorite tools from Google Chrome are Viewed Page Source. So if I click that, I actually see this is what it looks like when my browser is not interpreting anything. We've got our H2 tag, so that's a header. Uh, we've got our paragraph, so here's P. And my browser is looking at all this and deciding, OK, so this is what this is actually going to look like when I open it on the page for the user to look at. Uh, the other tool that we use more often because it's more helpful is the inspector. So if I right click and hit inspect, I can then see every element. We call these elements the combination of uh, tags and content. And if I hover over, I can see this is my paragraph here. This is my heading. And we can use this to look at exactly what we want to see. Now, the most important part of these pages 
or arguably, is the hypertext part. The hypertext part of it is I can click on this uh, A tag, which stands for Acre, Anchor, sorry, uh, and my href, my hypertext reference, is going to go to pmashow.com slash grape, which as it turns out is a site about if you put grapes in a microwave, they explode. He, yeah, just uh, it, he wanted to see if HTML could convey content like this. So the content is less important. It's still great. I love this site. Um, but if I look here, my href, so my HTML reference, is taking me to a whole other website. And if I find this on the web page here, right, so if I click on this link, it'll take me to another page, another set of files, another folder. That's the hypertext part. That's the really important part. So if I look here, I've got my ahref tag, which takes me to Canadian Cyber Defense Intelligence.ca. If I click here to visit the CDC, um, if I click on this link, it'll take me to CDC, CCDC rather. Uh, now the important thing is, reference is a really important concept when we're programming. We use references all the time, and it's just the word we use to say, I want to talk to something else. I want to use something else from outside of here. Uh, the fun thing about the element editor is I can actually edit this stuff inside the page. So if I wanted, I could change this reference to uh, Google's a pretty innocuous site, but if I change this, I click on grapes a case study and it takes me to Google. So the tags here don't necessarily have to have anything to do with in what's inside. It's just how the browser is interpreting things. The user doesn't see that. Now, the other thing is uh, CSS, cascading style sheets. I'm not going to really talk about CSS because CSS doesn't really do anything beyond making stuff look pretty, uh, which is actually pretty important because this is what HTML looks like without CSS, and it's kind of brutal to look at. Um, this is a website that a partner and I built in the software developing program. It took us two days to build this, uh, and as you can see, it's quite a bit nicer. Um, it's got a couple A tags here. It doesn't really do anything. This is what we would call a static website because it looks the exact same to every user. No matter who visits this, they're going to see the same page every time. That's because I don't have any JavaScript in it. JavaScript is the language for making stuff happen on the web. Um, and the it's, you can see it all in the name script. It's a scripting language. And it's designed to do some logic. So here's a good example of uh, how we might do some really, really basic JavaScript. Um, and I'm going to show you another page that I had built, um, or that I did build. Uh, I built this in about 10 minutes using JavaScript. So JavaScript is really powerful. Um, but this is an example of an active website. It's not static because I can put a name in here, and it will change how the page appears. So if I go in my elements here, I can see that my body has nothing in it. My results container is empty. So if I click, type in Star Wars and I press search, I get all of these new pieces of HTML in here. This is what JavaScript does for us. It allows us to change the HTML in a website in real time to respond to what the user is doing. Uh, now the important part of this is not actually, well, the, the really important part of this markup here is this script tag. This is another reference. I'm giving it my source, which is main.js. So if I look at my sources here, I can actually see these are all the things that make up my web page. So I've got my index, which is my HTML. I've got my styles, which is my CSS, which is really small because I have very little CSS on here, which is why this looks so uh, bad. But then I go to my JavaScript, and it's my JavaScript that's doing all that work of filling in the HTML. Now, you're not going to need to know what all this does, but this is basically what it looks like. We have our elements. We have, uh, sorry, we have our data. We have our variables. We're able to change things. And this is where I'm actually changing around the HTML here. I'm sticking in new HTML to contain the movie title and the poster. So what this might look like in a really basic HTML so in my index, if I have a div for an ID with greeting, my page just says, hello. And underneath that, I have a script. And the source leads to my JavaScript, which is another file. 
Now this again is a bit scary looking, but it's actually very basic. What you need to know is that my JavaScript is looking for my element called greeting here. And I'm going to add an event listener called click. And if I click, it's going to change the inner HTML on that element to read salut instead, because I'm trying to be bilingual. So if I clicked on hello, it would change the HTML in here to read salut. That's more or less how JavaScript works in this rhythm. It's waiting for events, and when events fire, it changes the HTML inside. So that's the exact same thing that happens. Well, not the exact same, but when I put in a new title here and I click on this, it changes the HTML inside. So JavaScript is probably one of the most revolutionary concepts to come to, to, uh, to internet pages, like Facebook, stuff like that. Those really huge interactive websites are a lot of very complicated JavaScript. And that's changing how your website is looking all the time. Now, this is all the front end side of things, the uh, client side, as I've shown you. What this is also doing is it's actually getting some back end information, which means I'm going to go out to a server using this fetch. And again, you don't need to know exactly what this is doing. This is just sort of pointing out how this works. I'm fetching a website called OMDB. Uh, it's a free website that has, uh, I think, several million films on it or something like that. I'm making a request to OMDB, and I'm saying, I want some information from your server. I send that request to the server using fetch and a bunch of complicated stuff in here. And that server probably looks something like this. Uh, an SQL server looks an awful lot like an Excel page, if you've ever done that, or like a spreadsheet. Um, and it's just a lot of data that's all related to each other. I'm going to pull this data into my website and I'm going to have a change how it looks. So I'm reaching out to another server. I'm pulling some files. I'm pulling some stuff and changing my HTML. Now, uh, I use structured query language, or SQL, to do a lot of this. So on my front end, I'd use something like fetch. Uh, I would fetch from the omdb.com. Uh, in my example, I always use the matrix, but then I later changed it to the net. But my point being that my inner SQL that's in the back end, the SQL is probably doing something like select the top 10 uh, titles here from table movies, where the title equals the net. And then it will return to me all of that HTML that I'm trying to get from it. So my client is making a request to a server. That server is returning stuff to me, and I'm using JavaScript to update my web page. So that's how I get dynamic pages like this. Uh, and that's really it for some basic, basic web application architecture. Uh, it really just boils down to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, making requests, making changes.